and how great thou art. I chose that song for a different reason this morning, not for the reason that I now have in my mind. But don't we have an awesome God? Amen. Amen. You know, looking back on, on things, especially in my life, I don't know anybody's life, but looking back on my life, there's, there's things that, that God should have just reached down and just forced me like a the things that I've done. But yet, instead of doing that, he decided, you know what? Instead of doing that, I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm going to give him salvation. I'm give him of his sin. That's the kind of God that we serve. If you stop and think about it, this little windstorm that we had, uh, it was little to us. Of course, it was catastrophic down on the coast. But this little storm that we had, do you realize how easy it would be for God just to wipe us all of this place? Wipe us off the face of the earth. But yet for Thousands of years we've been surviving this storm because God watches out now. And, you know, the songs that, that are played today, Victory in Jesus, or that Kevin played, Victory in Jesus, I Saw the Light, and How Great Thou Art, they all sing a message to us, probably more important message than the message you're going to get from me today, about how great that God is. And I hope everybody that's here today has seen the light. And if you haven't, maybe you'll see the light before you leave here today. Because there is victory in Jesus. Now I want to thank Andy for his uh, message he sent out. Y'all can call it a devotion if you want to. But that was not a devotion, that was a message. And it was a message that we all needed to, to hear and we all needed to respond to. And that message uh, I kind of brought me to where I am today for this message. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to take your work, Andy. I could never compare it with what you sent out. But I do want to make a few points right here. You know, we are living in a time that seems to be very stressful. And, and for different reasons. Uh, you know, there's political reasons, there's economic reasons, there's, there's your physical health reasons, there's a lot of things uh, in today's world that just bring a lot of stress on us and, and kind of sometimes maybe cause us to act the way that we shouldn't act. Now, Andy's uh, message was about loving your brother and showing God's love to him. And today's message, I have, you know, sometimes I've titled my messages and I've titled this one here, and it will confuse you when I read the title, I'm sure, because I have titled it, Take Up Your Cross and Salt the World. You didn't know your cross was a salt there, did you? Let's think about this for just a minute. If we look at ourselves, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but if we look at ourselves and what the scripture says that we're the salt of the world, let's just think about God having a big old salt shaker and just shaking us out here and there in the world, and here's one of those little grains of salt. And you have a job to do. Well, before we can do that job uh, that we have to do, we need to understand there are some requirements. The first requirement is, is that you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you do that by believing Him in your heart and confessing Him with your mind and putting your faith and your trust in Him. And then that, after you do that, brings on obedience. And then you are, you are obedient uh, to the Lord. But open your Bibles or your phones or your iPads or the screen that Kevin has on up here. Some of those people who had a look at the shop when I said Bible read this one. Uh, to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. And we're going to talk about the cross, and then we're going to talk about salt. And then we're going to talk about life. So I don't want you to get confused in what we're saying here. I took two sermons and wound them up into one, okay, because this is really two different sermons. But Andy's message was so powerful last week that I just, I, I had to touch on it. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. 
And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. When he shall come into his own glory and in his Father and of the Holy Angel. But I tell you the truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now we know that that took place. And Jesus is talking about taking up your cross and following him. You say, well, I don't want to want to get one of those crosses with a wheel on it and go drag it down the side of the interstate. Uh, and, that, and that itself has a good message, but that's not what Jesus is saying. What he's talking about is he, if we stop and think, Jesus went to the cross and, and died on the cross. And I want to correct something that I've been saying for a lot of years. I'd say that he is, was a sacrifice for our sins. Well, that's almost correct. He wasn't a sacrifice. He was the sacrifice for our sins. And if he gave his life for us so that we could have salvation, doesn't it make sense that when we accept that free gift of salvation, because that's what it is, it's a free gift. You can't earn it, you can't buy it. You can't inherit it from your parents. The government's not going to give it to you. It's a free gift of God. And if we're going to accept that free gift, shouldn't we be thankful enough and shouldn't we love our Savior enough that we would put forth the effort to take up a cross and follow Him? And when I say take up a cross, what I'm talking about is we live in a world uh, that is full of attractions and it's full of evil. And not all the attractions of this world are evil, by the way. You know, God created this world and he created a, a very beautiful thing when he did. And it's an attractive place in some places. Uh, I would dare say it was an attractive place in all places before he put man here and had man to mess it up. But it's an attractive place. And it's not a, the world itself, the things that God created, is not an evil thing. But what mankind and Satan has done with it turns it into an evil world. And we live in a world that is full of evil things. And what he's saying when he says, take up your cross and follow me, he's talking about turning your back on those evil things of the world. Yes, you may have to sacrifice something. You probably will have to sacrifice something. But it's something that you didn't need in the first place. And God replaces it with better things than the things that we give up. But he says, take up your cross and follow me. Turn your back on this world that we live in and live in such a manner that it brings glory to God. Live in the, in the teachings that Jesus Christ gave us. He taught us all through the New Testament, Jesus' teaching. And, it, and it's really, it's a good thing. Because Jesus would, he would uh, go out and, and sometimes he would just be a gathering of people and he would be up there and just preach this sermon. And I say preach, he was teaching the sermon, if you look at the sermon on the mountain, the attitudes, and all the things that he taught while he was standing there, he was a teacher. And he was teaching us how to live our life. He was teaching us the truth about God and the truth about salvation. So he teaches us how to live. Wouldn't you think that it would be in our best interest to put aside the things that, that handicap us and hinder us in this world and follow Jesus in the way that he intended. Now you realize how much better our life would be if we just followed what Jesus told us to do. Amen. But you know what? There's this thing called peer pressure and this thing uh, that we have that's called worry and a thing that we put on ourselves that's called stress and it keeps us from seeing the truth. The song said, I saw the light. Sometimes it puts blinders on us we can't see the light, but so we walk off in a direction all our own and we leave Jesus behind until we get ourselves in trouble and then here we come back because we see the light and we go back to the light. You see, we can't live for the world, not for the things that this world has to offer, 
There's another world that we're supposed to be living for, and it's the kingdom of God. You know, the scripture tells us, and, and I didn't put this in here, but the scripture tells us to store up our treasures in heaven where moth does uh, eat our stuff up and it doesn't grow and rust and, and vanish away, then it's secure. But instead, we tend to have a, a tendency, since we're here on this earth physically, that we try to store up as much treasures as we can on this earth, neglecting the treasures that we're storing up in heaven. <clears throat> and I don't believe that there's anything wrong with the treasures on this earth either. As long as they are in God's will and you don't put them before God's will in your life. Now, when we turn away from God and all we dwell on is the treasures of this world. And I'm going to tell you, I have been guilty. I have confessed to this church before. Sometimes where my priorities have been in the past. But our priorities need to be on Jesus Christ. Because the world that we live in doesn't offer us a whole lot of good things. It offers us some attractive things, maybe some comfortable things, but in the end, the things of this world lead to destruction. Because Satan has put his hand on it, and he's ruined it through mankind. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. <laughs> again, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But this is where we've, where we've come to in this world. And it's a scripture that, that just really paints a picture of the world that we live in. And I want to make note that as we read this scripture, I want you to realize this is in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis is about the creation of the world and mankind and the actions of mankind. We're only in chapter 6. Okay? Look at what the scripture says. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Think about that. The whole world all they thought about were evil things. Imagining evil things. Thinking evil thoughts. But we can't, we can't take up our cross and, and follow Jesus if that's what's in our hearts and in our minds. And you say, well, that's not in my heart. It might pop into my mind, but it's not in my heart. You know, we, we've had discussions many, many times. We've had discussions in Sunday school and Wednesday night Bible studies, and I've had discussions down here to all of the people that talk, talk about. I can't control my thoughts. Something just pops into my mind. Well, guess what? You're not the only thing pops into everybody's mind. It's not what pops into your mind. It's what you do with that thing that pops into your mind that counts. Well, he says the thoughts of his heart was evil. Oh, continue. An evil heart. We can't have an evil heart and take the cross and follow Jesus. We've got to get that rectified. In Matthew chapter 15, if y'all turn to Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 through 19, Jesus is speaking. He says, Do ye not, do ye, do not ye yet understand? that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out in the drop in the drought. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, and blasphemy. Now they're having a discussion about what defiles a man, and they were talking about such things as eating with unwashed hands or, or eating certain meats, how that will defile a man. And Jesus is saying, it's not what you eat. It's not where you wash your hands or not. It's what comes out from your inner man. What's in your heart? What comes out of your mouth starts in your heart. That's what he said. And he says that, you know, that, that's what, that's, that's the thing that defiles mankind. Is what's in his heart. Now, we're talking about following Jesus. You say, well, I'm not really following you here. What's, 
What are you trying to say? Well, what I'm trying to say is this. As Christians, and I hope that everybody in here is Christians. There are probably some in here that might not be. But I hope that you are. But as Christians, it is our duty. Yes, our duty. I didn't say our uh, right or our uh, blessing or any of that. It's our duty to take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. If we take up our, fall, our cross and we follow Jesus, then we will be making a difference in this world. It says um, in verse 25 of Luke, it says, For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? You don't want to trade your soul to the things of the world. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and his Father and in the holy angels. You don't want Jesus to be ashamed of you. I don't, I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. Uh, I'm sure there are times when he's ashamed of me, but I don't want him to be ashamed of me. And if we sit around and, and we just pull back and we don't take up our cross and follow him because we're ashamed or we're afraid or there's too much peer pressure, how much peer pressure do you think would have been on Jesus when he was crucified? That's a lot of peer pressure because the whole world is getting it. What about us as individuals when it comes to peer pressure? Are we going to double down and back up and go, you know what? There's this conversation going on, and I know that it's wrong, and I'm not going to speak out against it. And by the way, taking up your cross and following Jesus is more than just your speech, it's your actions. Because people see your actions, and they take your actions more serious than your words. People can say anything, but it's what you do that people see, and that's, and that's what people look at and go, well, that's the way that person is. Right? But anyway, are we going to stand back and let the evil of this world prevail when we are taking up our cross, when we're the disciples of Jesus, when we're saved people, are we going to speak out for what the Scripture says, what Jesus teaches? Or are we just going to stand back and say, well, no, I'm not in that conversation. I'm not going to, to get involved and, and create an argument. And I'm not telling you to argue. Don't ever argue with people because... The fact of the matter is, if they're like me, they're hard-headed, and you can argue with them until the sun goes down, and you ain't going to change their mind. Okay? And I can give you a good example of that this weekend. <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, she knows what I'm talking about. And by the way, I was right. <laughs> That's the hell of change their mind if they're dug in, but you can let them know what the scripture says and plant that seed. And if they get curious enough or the Lord deals with their heart, they go home and get that book and they open that book up and go, you know what? I was wrong and they were right. But if you stand there and argue with them and, and try to beat it into their hands, you're not going to get anywhere with that. that matter of fact, they're going to shut you out and say, well, I ain't listening to them. But we've got a job to do. And we do it by the things we say and by our actions and by being dedicated to our salvation that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now we're going to swap gears here just a little bit. Turn to Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. My Bible is catching the salt of the earth. I said that I named this Take Up Your Cross and Salt the World. I don't know if any of you have ever sat down at a dinner table or any time you're going to eat. I don't care what meal it is. Even if we're having an ice cream cup. If you've ever sat down at the table with my wife and Mike Porter, you will know the importance of salt. <laughs> because if there's one salt shaker on that table, you're going to be continuously passing it back between those two people <laughs> because they like their salt. I said earlier, just think of yourself as a grain of salt and a salt shaker and God shaking us out all over the world because there's a reason He calls us the salt of the earth. Well, let's read what He says right here. Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth. 
but, he throws a but in there. It sounds good when Jesus says, you know what, you're the salt of the earth. Kind of like when he looked at Peter and said, Peter, you're a rock. I bet Peter, oh boy, he wasn't talking about Peter, he was talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salt? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Think about that. Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, but if your salt's not any good, it ain't good for nothing. You can't use it for nothing. Now salt, has a, it plays an important part. In, in the world, it always has. In the Old Testament, salt is a symbol of purity. They use salt in sacrifice. In, in just even in this world that we live in, as, as much as 100 years ago, salt was used as a preservative for food. Still is. When you can, put, when you can stuff, you put more salt in there. With it. So it's a purifier, and it's a preserver, preservative. But it also, what else do we do with salt? Some of us use a little bit on our food. There's a couple of people in here that put a little food with their salt. <laughs> but it changes the flavor of the food. Now, since this uh, virus outbreak has, has taken place, if any of you have been out to eat, and you go and there's a salt sh safe shaker on the table and you pick it up and try to get that salt out of there and it ain't nothing but just a rock, just plotted it. Because they come by and they spray disinfect it all over everything, including the salt shaker, and down in it go. And then the salt's no good. You can't get it out. It's not good for anything. It don't taste the same. And that's what Jesus is saying. How are we going to give flavor to this world if our salt is no good? If our salt's not any good, what can you do with it? You can throw it on the sidewalk when it snows and, and it has an ice storm, or you can take it out in the yard and pour it out on the weed so that weed won't grow. But other than that, what good is that salt? We need to be good salt. We don't need to just be salt. We need to be useful salt. And he says, in verse 14, he says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. If we're the light of the world and the salt of the earth, we need to be doing something. And in order for us to do something, we need to be following Jesus Christ with our cross daily. What am I saying? I'm saying the same thing Andy said in his devotion. We need to, in these trying times, in this evil world that we live in, we need to be going out and showing God's love to our brothers and sisters. Not just our brothers and sisters in Christ, but our brothers and sisters in the world because they need to know Jesus Christ. And the greatest gift you can give anybody, the most love you can show anybody is if you give them the words that lead them to Jesus Christ because that is the gift that keeps on giving. It doesn't ever end. But if our salt's no good, the Bible is going away. And then we can't do anything. If our light's hid, he, he says about the light, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be healed. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. You ever been in a dark room, fire goes off, and you got a coal lamp or a, or a candle, and you light that candle, and everybody gathers around that light because they want to be able to see. And when we were when my children were little, we had those lamps, you know, the fire used to go off pretty frequently. It wasn't as reliable then as it is now. We would light that thing, and we'd set it there on the coffee table or on the end table so we could sit in the living room and place see each other, and the kids would be running through there like a bunch of patches. Ah, don't get near the lamp! But in reality, what we need to be doing is when we light that lamp, is we need to lift it up so everybody can see it so they can come to the light. The song that we heard was, I saw the light. How did he see the light? He seen the light through the Word of God. And how do we shine our light? Not by lighting a candle or a lamp or flipping a switch and having lights come on, but by the light that should shine through us, the light of Jesus Christ, the light that God places in us. 
One more seven. And then he says in verse 16, and you can take this as a as a anything but a suggestion. I don't want to call it a commandment. It's not listed with commandment. I don't want to call it an order because the followers aren't ordered to this and follow because of love. But he says this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now let me stop right there. The good works that they see is not because we're good. It's because we're doing the things that Jesus taught us to do. That's the good works. Spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and spreading the love of God through this world. He says that he may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now I want you to think about that statement. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the next time that we go out into the world, which will be here in just a few minutes, when we go out to the door, we go out into the world and something upsets us or something tempts us or there's some thing that causes us great anguish or just a little bit of aggravation. Before we act, we should stop and ask ourselves this. Is the thing that I'm fixing to do, is that going to bring glory to God? And if it doesn't, guess what? You shouldn't do it. Now that's hard to do. That's hard to do. Because when we get aggravated or angry, we lash out. That's human nature. It's, it's like I told my boss at work before. I'll do most anything that you ask me to do within reason. But don't tell me to do something, because I don't like that. I don't like to be told what to do. Ask me to do something, I'll do what I can, but don't tell me to do something. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she lets me do something. <laughs> she says, I'm going to let you go out to the car and get so and so out of the car. Today she's going to let me go home and use a chainsaw. <laughs> but she didn't tell me to do it. She was going to let me do it. So when you run up against those things that, that you normally push back against, think about this. Are my actions going to glorify God? A lot of times our actions don't glorify God at all. They glorify us or they glorify mankind. And how are we going to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ if those people that see us see our actions and hear our words, if they don't reflect Jesus Christ, how are they ever going to see the light? You're that salt that is going out on the earth. You're supposed to give the earth some flavor. You're supposed to change things. I think the biggest change we need to make is in ourselves. So we can go out and make the changes that God would have this world to see. Because we can't change the world. Let me tell you that right now. There's not a one of us or a group of us that can go out and change the world. But God can. He can change the world through the actions of His people. If His people would only act the way that He taught them that. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're curious about Christ as Lord and Savior. Or you've been under conviction and you know that you need a Savior, that you're lost and there's not anything you can do about it because you've already done everything else. I want you to think about this. In Romans 10 and 9, it says, If you'll believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died and that is this is not word for word, but the gist of it is, and he died for your sins, and God raised him up from the dead. If you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, he says, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Read for yourself. See what it says. Because God doesn't exclude people. People exclude people. We're good at excluding people. We're not very good at, at gathering people together. But God doesn't exclude people. His word stands for every person that has ever been born on the face of this earth. No matter how bad you think they are, or no matter how bad God knows they are, His word and His sacrifice was for them just like it was for us. And that's the message that we have to put out there. It doesn't matter. God can save you.